So Herod the Great was the Roman appointed king of Judea during the time of Jesus' birth. Um, his father, Antipater, is there an echo on me? Am I the only one who feels a little bit? I'm sorry. Uh, am I? Okay. So his father, Antipater, uh, was by descent an Edomite whose ancestors had converted to Judaism. And as a result, Herod was raised as a Jew. Now, however, um, the historian Josephus characterized Herod this way. This is what he said about him. He said, Herod was of great barbarity toward all men equally. And he also called him a slave to his passions. All right, other historians, while they applaud uh, many of his accomplishments, this is what they said about him. They describe him as an insecure, maniacal tyrant. <laughs> okay. And so the end of his life says a lot about him in that as murderous as he was, he eventually would attempt uh, to commit suicide and would fail in doing so. Uh, historians also note that he was so concerned that no one would mourn his own death that he commanded a large group of distinguished men to come from Jericho or to Jericho. And he gave them the order that they should be killed at the time of his death, just so that the displays of grief that he so badly craved would take place. I mean, the man was cray cray, all right, crazy. All right, throughout Herod's reign, the mere hints that someone would try to take his throne had been enough to trigger him into a series of murderous rages. Uh, in order to uh, preserve or consolidate his own power, Herod had killed three of his own sons. Uh, he had killed his son-in-law, his mother-in-law, his brother, his uncle, his wife. Now, he had 10 wives, but he killed his favorite one. Okay. And many, many other friends and acquaintances. And it is on this man's doorstep that these foreign dudes walk up to in Matthew chapter 2 asking for a king who's been recently born in the area. Okay, I'm trying to set the, the tension of this moment that we're going to read together. Are you ready to read it with me now? Okay, so Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1, it says this. It says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having warned, uh, been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet out of Egypt. I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Jerusalem in its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time that he had learned from the Magi. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you. I 
I thank you that you are here. Lord, I thank you, just as I read this morning, Lord, that you remembered us in our lowest state. Lord, I thank you that you've delivered us from our enemies, from sin, death, and the grave. I'm reminded of what Martin Luther famously said when he said that scripture is the manger in which the Christ lies. And so may we handle your word today with the reverence that it deserves. Lord, uh, may the Christ be found today as we look at this passage. We just thank you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. 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 Now, most of the stories that we read and that we talk about uh, when it comes to the birth of Jesus and, and of Christmas uh, are filled with glad tidings and great joy. Yeah. Like a joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Uh, well, Matthew chapter two shows us the dark side of that reality. Matter of fact, uh, the whole reason why Matthew includes this story in his gospel account is because this story tells us something about who Jesus is. It tells us something about what Jesus came to do. And it also tells us something about Christmas. Because Christmas is not, um, Christmas is not a message that uh, darkness is completely gone. That, 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 there, that it's the end of darkness. Do you understand that? Like the message that Christmas is meant to, uh, to convey is that there is light in darkness. There is a light in darkness. And as children of the light, as the Bible calls us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, as children of the light, we are meant to be representatives of that message, aren't we? We're meant to be representatives. And so the question that I want to pose as we get started this morning is, how can we be light in darkness? How can we proclaim joy to the world? And I'm just going to give you the answer right up front because I like you guys. Okay. All right. No suspense. The answer is that we, as the people of God, we must be the first ones who receive the king. We must be the first ones to receive the king. We must, as the song says, uh, we must lead the charge in having hearts that prepare him room. All right. Now, in order to do so, I think we have some problems to solve. And I believe from this text, I can show you what those problems are and how to solve it. Are you guys all right with that? Yeah. So from this text, I want to show you uh, that we, we must see that uh, we all want to be king. All right. We all want to be king. Uh, that we are hostile to the true king. We're all hostile to, to God's rule. And lastly, I want to show you the cure to this hostility. All right. That's what I want to show you. So first, let's look at the fact that we all want to be kings. Now, these, these men, they come from this far and distant land. And they're asking for the one who's been born king of the Jews. And it, it disturbs Herod. Now, when you know the history of the terror in the life of Herod, it's easy to understand how he could be so disturbed by this newborn king of the Jews. But I would submit to you that King Herod's uh, reaction to Christ is a picture of us all. His reaction is a picture of us all. Uh, Tim Keller, uh, in his book, Hidden Christmas, has helped me so much to understand this point. And, and here's the idea. All right, so if you're the CEO of your company, and the board of directors elects and hires a new CEO. You would feel a certain type of way about that, wouldn't you? If you were a salesperson in a specific territory with your company, and then your company hires another salesperson for that territory, you would feel a certain way about that. All right, do I have to come into your story? Okay. And so when it comes to Herod's situation, you know, T Keller says that if you want to be king and someone comes along and he says he is the king, then one of you has to give in, right? Why? Because only one person can sit on an absolute throne, right? 
Only one person can do it. So when Jesus comes to us claiming to be God, when he comes to us saying he is the king, it inevitably triggers deep resistance within our hearts. Uh, He goes on to say this. He says, according to the Bible, the evil of the world ultimately stems from the self-centeredness, the self-righteousness, and self-absorption of every human heart. Each of us wants the world to orbit around us and our needs and desires. In every heart, then, there is a little King Herod (laughs) that wants to rule and is threatened by anything that may compromise his omnipotence and sovereignty. Each of us wants to be captain of our own soul, master of our own fate. Now, we see this in the movies we watch, right? Uh, my, my three favorite movies about kings, um, I would argue, are the best movies about kings. I'll put them up against any list you come up with, okay? My three favorite movies about kings, all right, here in particular order, all right? Black Panther, okay? King T'Challa. All right, number two, Lion King, Mufasa. Ooh, say it again, right? Number three, 300, Leonidas. Get out of here. These are some bad brothers. Bad. Do you guys know, too, that these three movies made combined over $2.5 billion dollars and box office ticket sales. I mean, they made a lot of, these are instant classics. And the reason why I I believe that's the case is because we all like to see ourselves in these kings. We we like to see ourselves, we want to be king. This desire is so deeply embedded in us that many of us don't even see it. And everything we do seems to only reinforce this desire. Even as we read the Bible, by the way. A lot of us, when we read the Bible, we sit down, we look at the people in the Bible and we look at the stories and we assume that they are narratives that teach us how to stay on the throne of our our very own hearts. We read the story of David and we're like, all right, man, if if I'm going to have victory in my life, I'm going to have to knock down my giants. We look at the story of Esther and we say, man, I was born in such a time as this to save my people. We look at the story of Joseph and we say, man, I'm, I'm going to go from the pit to the prison to the palace. If it's to be, it's up to me. I'm king. I'm king. Now, can I tell you a story? So please, it's like, stop talking about me. Okay, so when I was a kid, my aunt bought me and my cousins a dozen donuts, okay? And as she opened the box, I immediately realized that there were more donuts than people. And and I think that as I saw it, I think my aunt saw that I saw it. And so she said to me, don't you even think about taking an extra donut? And so we all ate our donuts and eventually my cousins, they left the kitchen and my aunt got distracted. What do you think I did? I was a good kid, guys. I was a good kid. All right. But I took another donut. So I took it. I ran to the bathroom. I hid it, which is gross. I hid it in the bathroom. Okay. I hid it in the bathroom. I came out made sure the coast was clear, waited like 15, 20 minutes just to make sure there was no controversy, that no one knew a donut was missing. 15, 20 minutes later, I ran back in the bathroom, I grabbed the donut and I ate it while looking at myself in the mirror. (laughs) And can I just tell you something real quick? I mean, while I'm confessing everything, and by the way, Auntie Linda, if you're watching, I love you and I'm sorry. Can I just confess to you guys, I wasn't even hungry. I wasn't hungry. And I didn't even think about it. Like, like it really didn't register in my mind that I should take another one until she told me not to take it. It didn't even register in my head. The moment she said there was no issue until she said no. 
But when she said no to me, what rose up in my seven-year-old self was no one tells me what to do. Her, her command aroused this fundamental sinfulness of heart. And you know what that is? It's the desire to be God instead of be under God. It's the desire to be Savior rather than depend on a Savior. I wanted to be the master of my own faith. I wanted to be captain of my own soul. King. That's what I wanted. We all have similar stories. Don't be looking at me like that. <laughs> We're all this way. We're all fighting this battle. We want to be king. But not only do we want to be king, let me, let me take this further. Okay? Because not only do we want to be king, we are hostile to the true king. We are hostile to God's rule. Uh, we see that when Herod realized that the Magi flaked on coming back to tell him where this baby king was, he ordered all the baby boys in Bethlehem who were two years old and, and younger to be slaughtered. Now, Psalm number two, uh, Psalm, Psalm number two, Psalm two is one of a handful of royal psalms. Okay, it, it's uh, what you can call a coronation psalm. And it starts like this. It says, why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. Now, this psalm is actually referring to specific people, but it's also meant to capture the, the posture of humanity. All right, we are the ones who conspire and plot against him. We are the ones who set ourselves against the Lord and his anointed. Romans 8 verse 7 says this, which is similar. It says, for the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and it never will. So we have a natural hostility. Uh, we have a natural hostility towards all claims of sovereignty over us. There's something in our hearts that resents those claims. And so when I say that you and I have a little King Herod in our hearts, I'm not calling you a murderously evil tyrant, okay? It's not what I'm calling you. But what I am saying is that the throne of your heart is not uncontested territory. Do you understand that? It is not uncontested territory. Without the intervention of God himself, we will fight tooth and nail to stay on the throne. Though we would like to see ourselves as T'Challa, though we would like to think of ourselves as Mufasa, though we would like to believe that we're a lot like Leonidas, there is way more killmonger in us. There's way more scar and Xerxes in us than we would like to believe. There just is. Since Jesus Christ, when rightly understood, evokes extreme responses. He evokes extreme responses. If you understand Jesus' claims on you, it'll force you into one of three extremes. Right? Fight, flight, or delight. Okay, Fight, flight, or delight. You see this all throughout Jesus' ministry. That as people encounter Jesus and Jesus encounter people, you see one of three responses. You see that people either wanted to kill him, that people ran away from him, or they bowed down their knees to worship him. Extreme responses. You know, meanwhile, we're over here and we're singing songs, you know, joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. We sing it cheerfully, but, but just so you know, like that truth killed babies, <laughs> And so when it comes to uh, Herod and th this, um, this slaughter of the innocents, is what they call that event, the massacre of all these uh, baby boys, two years old and younger. When, when it comes to that event, at the very least, we see that Herod understood what Jesus' claim as king meant. Yeah. Yeah. And so when it comes to the lordship of Jesus in your life, and this one's going to hurt, so just buckle up. When it comes to the lordship of Jesus Christ in your life, if you are not mad yeah. or bowing down in worship, then you do not understand his claims on you. 
we still friends? Are we good? Still? <laughs> now, if you're here and you would say, man, Sean, I'm, I'm moderate, you know, I'm really indifferent. You know, as you would describe yourself that way. Um, then I would submit to you, if you were a moderate and you say, you know, I'm, I'm pretty indifferent, pretty chill when it comes to Christ. Oh, the, the star, star of Bethlehem right there. All right, if you're moderate when it comes to Jesus, I would submit to you that you are no different than those who ran away from Jesus in his day. You're no different than those who ran away because running away is a way to avoid the hostility. All right, uh, to run away is masked hostility. And there are two ways to run away, to two ways to distance yourself from Jesus. One is to be really, really bad, to break all the rules, to live an immoral life. But then the other way is to be really, really good. It's to keep all the rules. It's to live this moral life in an attempt to put God in your debt, thinking he has no claims on you. Both are ways of distancing yourself, though, from Jesus. It only suppresses the hostility, but it's still there. And so if you're here uh, and you're like me, I'm going to see if I can get everyone, capture everyone in the room. Okay. If you're like me and you would say that Christ, Sean, Christ is my king and savior, I would say to you that even you and I have a residual hostility towards God in our hearts. It's residual. All right, let me prove it to you. Why is it so hard to pray? You ever notice? I'm more in church. You can tell the truth. Why is it so hard to pray? Let's talk about our devotional life. Why so inconsistent? You ever thought about that? I mean, this is, it's the word of God, right? It's the word of truth. Why is it so hard for us to read it? Uh, how about forgiveness? Why is it so hard for you to forgive? Uh, you do know what Jesus did for you, right? So why do you struggle with it? Why? Paul said it this way in scripture. He said, the good that I desire to do, I don't do. And the evil that I don't want to do, I do do. Okay. I'm in deep do do. That's what he said. Okay. He didn't say that, but it's inferred. But he understood something. He understood this. That even as believers, we have to fight to keep Jesus on the throne of our hearts. Why? Because there's something in us that fights it. Something in us. And so what's the cure? Huh? What's the cure? As someone comes up to play the keys. Lastly, I want to show you the cure. Because if like Herod, we want to be king. And if like Herod, we are all hostile to God into his rule, then how do we deal with this hostility so that we can receive the king and prepare him room in our hearts? Uh, I think the Magi gives us the key. Now, when you read this story, you can get really distracted by everything Herod's doing. All right. But there's something that the Magi does that I think is, a, is an important key for us, because I want you to think about what they did in this story. The Magi did three things. Um, uh, number one, they made a long journey they followed a star and they worshiped a baby. Okay. They made a long journey. They followed a star and they worshiped a baby. Now Psalm 84, five says, blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. All right. And so whenever you see this idea of a journey or a pilgrimage in scripture, almost always it is, is a metaphor for a spiritual quest. And so anyone who wants God must go on a journey. Let me say that again. Anyone who wants God must go on a journey. And the only way to set your heart on pilgrimage is if you are unsatisfied with the status quo. It's the only way you do it. You got to be unsatisfied with the status quo. 
It will take an acknowledgement that the inner tyrant and the pseudo saviors that you set on the throne of your heart are not sufficient. It's what it takes. Then once you do that, once you experience an inner revolution, you need revelation. All right. You need revelation. A star guided them to Jesus. It was a star. The star is a symbol of our need for divine revelation in order to find God. Jesus said it this way in John uh, chapter 6, verse 44. He says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And so we will never find God without God's help. We won't find him. Then they worship the baby. And when they worshiped the baby, they gave him three gifts, didn't they? They gave the baby gold, which was a symbol of kingship on earth. They gave him frankincense, which is a symbol of deity. And they gave him myrrh, which was a symbol of death. They went on a spiritual quest. They were led by God. And at the end, they understood what he came to do. They understood. They worshiped him as king. They worshiped him as God. And they acknowledged what it would cost to hold those titles. That's what they did. And so if you want to drain your heart of hostility towards God, if you really want to do it, then you're going to have to set your heart on pilgrimage. You're going to have to ask God to guide you as you go. And you are going to have to worship. And in your worship, regularly remind yourself of the cost he paid to come near you. Amen. Let's stand together. Um, Tim Keller sums up the, uh, the posture of the human heart as it relates to hostility when he says this. He says, see all human beings are in their natural condition and a state of warfare against God. We are all hostile towards God. We're all fighting against God and that's just the way it is. The proof of that, the only time God became vulnerable, the only time God became weak, the only time God became touchable we killed him. See, this baby that they worshiped in Matthew chapter 2, this baby would one day grow up. And they would put a crown on him. But it was not made of gold or gemstones. It was a crown of thorns. And they would put a robe on him, but it would not be putting on the robe in order to honor him. They did it in order to mock him. And at the climax of his life, he did ascend, but it wasn't to a throne. It was to a cross. And they did call him king, but they wrote it on a sign. They posted it above his head as he hung there dying for you and me. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. How do we do that? Set your heart on pilgrimage. We talked about it this morning and the worship set was so beautiful. Turn, turn. Anyone who wants God, anyone who wants him is gonna to have to go on a journey. And if your walk with God does not challenge you, it will not change you. Set your heart on pilgrimage today. Number two, ask God to guide you as you go. He wants to show up in supernatural ways in your life. Ask him to do that. He'll do it for you. And lastly, worship. And regularly, every single day, remind yourself, instill it in your heart 
what he went through to draw near to you. Amen. If you ever desire to be a light in darkness, man, if, you, if, if, you, if you want in any way to proclaim joy to this world, this must be our foremost mission and ambition. Amen. With all heads bowed, all eyes closed. If you're here today, you would say, Sean, I want to respond. That I recognize that like Herod, uh, I've put things on the throne of my heart, things that are not Jesus. I've not put Jesus. It's, It's anything but Jesus. And today I want to crown him King and Lord of my life. If you're here and you've never done this before, but you would like to do that today, just raise your hand. I just want to pray for you. Amen. I see you. I see you, sister. Wow. I see you too. Anyone else? I see four or five hands. Anyone else? I see you, brother. I see you in the back. Amen. 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 If you're here, you say, Sean, I'm a believer. Like I've been walking with, with the Lord for a while, but I know that I need to I need to make room for Jesus. I know I need to uh, shore this up. Just raise your hand. We just want to pray for you as well. I see you. I see you. Hands going up all over the place. Oh my gosh. So what we're going to do is we're going to have our prayer team come down. Uh, Children's ministry is dismissed. So if you have uh, children, please go get them. But if you need prayer, we absolutely want to pray for you. We have some safe people who are going to come up. and would love to partner with you in prayer. But let me just pray for you. Father, I just thank you for your nearness. I thank you that you sent Jesus. And you sent him as a baby. You sent him in weakness so that he would ultimately d- display strength as being our king and our God. That he is mighty to save because he came in a vulnerable state. And so today we receive the king. Today, Lord, we prepare our hearts or we make room for you, Lord. Be King and Lord of our lives today. We just thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name.